it's Mrs. M. Uh, in this video, I'm going to read you diary entries August 18th through the 21st in the Night Diary by Vera Heron and Donnie. Um, as I go through this time, what I want to do is I actually want to take you through some of my annotations and some of my own thoughts. And maybe that will help you in, in making your own if you are doing annotations, even though I'm not checking them. Remember, it's a really great strategy for you to use for close reading um, and to, to get more, uh, better comprehension and understanding out of the material. All right? Okay, so we are um, on page 99, and we're going to start um, August 18th, 1947. Dear Mama, I'm writing this only by moonlight under my mosquito net, so forgive me if it is messy. I can barely see what I'm putting down, but I have a talent. I can write without seeing. We tried to leave this morning. The sun hadn't even come up yet. Causey stayed in his cottage. Before bed, Causey came to say one last goodbye to us and told us he was going to stay in his cottage when we left in the morning because it was safer. Until I see you again, he said, and hugged us both. I couldn't cry. I felt like I was a dry leaf floating in the wind, wondering where I'd land. So right there I noted that was a simile. I just nodded and floated away from him. If I said goodbye, then it would be a real goodbye, a forever goodbye. Emil once drew a picture of Causey. It was of him in the kitchen with a towel thrown over his shoulder, chopping vegetables. Causey looked very serious in the picture, his eyes squinting, his lips pressed together. I went on into Emil's stacks of drawings that he keeps in the corner of our room and tried to find it, but I couldn't. Dottie quietly woke us, and we had yogurt and day-old roti without talking. Somehow, everyone knew that this was not a time for talking, as if the loud words placed in the, in the fragile air would break something. There is so much you can understand from a person's face, the way they stare or nod or press their lips together or turn their heads to the side in a certain way. So much talking happens with no words. We gathered our belongings and spoke with our eyes, our nods, our shrugs, our pointing fingers. I had my bag, Emil had his. We had bedrolls rolled up and strapped to our backs. Papa had loaded what he could in the covered horse carriage. Dottie's things, his clothes, two bedrolls, a mosquito net, his medicine bag, some books, all the food and jugs of water, some pots and pans and cups, and a wrapped painting of yours. Papa didn't show us the painting, but I know all the sizes. I think it's my favorite one of a hand holding an egg. I always wondered if you had painted someone's actual hand or if you had imagined it. It looks like a woman's hand. Was it Dottie's? Was it yours? Why was it holding an egg? When I saw it in the carriage, I felt so happy. More of you would be coming with us. I also have your jewelry. I have the dirt from our home and I have this diary. We planned to take a carriage to the train and we had to leave before dawn so no one would see us leaving. Papa had heard about fighting when people left. Raj and Rupesh uncle left days ago by train and are now on the other side. They're finding us a place to live so when we get there we will have a home. Papa says we are very lucky and there will be many people scattered with no homes. The hospital made Papa stay longer than he wanted to until a new doctor could come. A Muslim doctor is coming to fill Papa's post and work with Dr. Ahmed. He will move into our home. I guess Causey needs to stay and cook for him. I didn't want to think about it. When Papa came home on his last day at the hospital, he said he only said one thing. I hope he saves more than I did. Then he went into his room and didn't come out for the rest of the evening. I kept my bag close to me because I didn't want Papa or Dottie to feel how heavy it was because of the mortar and pestle. When we were packing yesterday, Papa made Emil bring the Mahabharata book and only a few scraps of paper and two pencils. Emil was furious that he had to take the book instead of his drawings, but Papa told him he couldn't throw fits like a child anymore, that he was almost a man now. Can you imagine, boys, gentlemen, being 11, 12 years old, and your dad telling you, you're almost a man now. You're not, you can't throw a fit like a child anymore. I'm not saying that you are throwing fits, but to think of that as back then, he is almost a man. That's how Papa is looking at him. Um, Emil stopped yelling and swallowed. 
Then he shook his head and walked away. Okay, I underlined that, uh, the use of movements to show character emotions. And what does that mean? He's yelling. He stopped yelling and swallowed. Then he shook his head and walked away. Okay, think about that. He went to our room and put all his drawings into one pile. He walked into the kitchen with them and begged Cosy to burn them in the stove. He said he didn't want to leave them for anyone else to take. Cosy took them, laid them on the table carefully, and promised Emil he'd keep them safe. He said if he left, he'd take them with him. No, Emil said. I'm almost a man. Then he grabbed them and thrust them into the lit coal stove. He was so quick, Cosy couldn't stop him. Emil ran outside. I stood staring at Cosy, and I felt the tears come again. But I wiped them away and walked over to the stove. I watched all Emil's drawings burn into ash. Cosy watched them too. He put his arm around me as we watched. He'll draw more. He'll make new drawings at your new home, he said, trying to make me feel better. But for some reason, I felt like I'd been stabbed in the heart. Emil, I said later in the day while Emil sat on the floor folding and unfolding a blank piece of paper. Why? They will burn here, so I might as well be here when they do. But Cosy said he'd keep them. Nobody's going to burn them. Emil just shook his head angrily. We don't know. Maybe someone will burn our house to the ground, he said in a low voice. That's not going to happen, I said. A new family is coming here. I'd rather it burn, Emil said to me, his eyes dark and wild. You don't mean that, I said, but I know he did. Emil just rocked back and forth, unfolding and folding his paper. I sat with him for a while and watched his fingers furiously climb over the paper. I could see the anger leak out of him a little bit. I took the soft, wrinkled piece from him. He let me. Let's go be with Cosy, Emil suddenly said, and got up quickly. I could tell he was trying to shake off his feelings. He didn't like to be angry. I loved that about him, that he really wanted to be happy. I love that here, Vera Heron and Donnie is showing us another way in which Emil and Nisha are different, but instead of viewing one another's differences as weaknesses or um, something that's negative, he, she views... Uh, they view each other's differences as something positive, right? They admire things in one another. Sometimes I like to hold on to my upsets. Like if I let them go, I'm admitting they weren't that important. But Emil isn't like that. When we fight, he's usually the first to apologize, the first to lift us out of our hurt. But in the last few days, I could see an anger always behind his eyes, smoldering. I wasn't sure I wanted to be with Cosy, but I followed. We sat with Cosy for the rest of the day while he packed up the kitchen and made food packages for us. He handed us pieces of radishes and peppers to snack on as we worked, as he worked. Then we began to help him, scrubbing pots and try, tying up bags of rice and lentils that Cosy would either pack for us or take with him to his cottage. It felt better to work, to keep my body moving. If I worked in the kitchen, I could pretend none of this was happening. We were just making dinner, like always. I wondered if I pretended enough. Would it become the truth? Then this morning, while we shoveled, shoveled outside in the cool air and finished loading up the carriage, we heard the sound of someone running toward us. I think I heard it first because I looked toward the sound and then everyone else looked. The scrape and scratch of sandals hitting dirt excuse me, moved closer, grew louder. Papa pushed the three of us back in the house. Go, he said in a harsh whisper, pushing at our backs. Hide in the pantry. Dottie grabbed our arms and pulled us inside. Someone was coming for us. We crouched in the pantry again, trying not to breathe. It was a lot emptier now. Dottie moved her lips slightly, murmuring prayers to herself. I could hear the low buzz of men's voices, but they didn't sound angry or scary. I was worried someone was coming to hurt Papa, but I held on to the sound of low voices. Papa's and another man's that sounded familiar, but I couldn't place him. Maybe it was someone telling us, page 106, telling us we didn't have to leave, that this was all a big mistake. I felt Dottie's warm, misty breath on my shoulder. Emil grabbed my hand. It was cold and dry. Mine was hot and sweaty. We waited for a long time. Suddenly, someone threw open the pantry door 
letting the first morning sun stream into our blinking, terrified eyes. We can't go today. It was Papa. I let my breath out. I wondered if that meant we weren't going at all. A little spark of hope teased at me. Why? Dottie asked. That was Cousin Nikhil. He said he heard terrible things about some trains trying to cross the border. They've decided to stay longer, but we can't. What terrible things? Emil said, his voice curious and hungry. I wanted to hear it too, Mama. I wanted to hear something so bad and terrible it would make me want to run away and never look back. I told you, people are being killed, Papa said in a flat voice, as if he were telling us to go to sleep. He didn't say what people, where, and how. Dottie, decided to, Dottie, Dottie started to murmur prayers out loud now. We all stayed crouched. Oh, sorry, I thought I paused my video. We all stayed crouched in the closet. Papa yelled at her. Ma! She stopped and quietly pressed her lips together. What will we do? She asked. It's at least a hundred miles to the border. We will leave on foot tomorrow. It's too light now, Papa said. We need to stay here one more day. We can stop at Rashid Uncle's on the way. I'll arrange for a messenger to notify him. It's about halfway. Rashid? Dottie said. Rashid Uncle? Emil asked, and my eyes lit up. I had heard the name before. It had to be your brother, Mama. I prayed Papa would answer Emil. Hush, Papa said. You all must listen to everything I tell you now. Tonight we will sleep at Causey's, so it looks like we're not here. The riots are getting closer. But, Emil said, and Papa put his hand up to stop him. Emil, Papa said sternly, enough. My shoulders sank. Then I felt the pang of guilt I always did when I wanted Emil to push Papa for answers. I wanted to see if I was right about Rashid Uncle. We had hardly ever been inside Causey's cottage. Causey only went there to sleep and spent his Sunday there, his day off. We were not to bother him then. Excuse me. But a few times when we were bored, Emil and I didn't listen and visited Causey anyway. Once, about a year ago, Emil found a strange tomato in the garden. It looked like three tomatoes stuck together. Let's show Causey, he said, holding it up, then balancing it on his head. We can't, I answered and took it from him so it wouldn't fall and bruise. I wanted to know what a three-headed tomato tasted like. You always listen to the rules, Emil said, and crossed his arms. Well, you never do, I shot back, and that's why you make Papa upset. Immediately, I felt bad for what I said. That wasn't really why Papa got frustrated with Emil. It was because Papa didn't understand why Emil was so bad at school and was worried he'd never become a doctor. But Emil didn't get mad at me. He just sighed. Why don't you talk this way to anyone else? You leave all the rule breaking to me. You like it that way. I didn't know what to say. Then he took the tomato from me and ran to Causey's house before I could do anything. I followed after him, excuse me again, stunned, wondering if I did like it that way. But I think he liked it that way too. I felt the things he couldn't feel and he said the things I couldn't say except to him. That's how it worked. Causey never let us stay long, just took our gift and shooed us off. I don't know what he did there all day long on Sundays. Mama, my eyes are drooping. I will finish when I can. Love, Nisha. And we're on page 109. August 19th, 1947. Dear Mama, there are two rooms in Cotty's cottage, a front room with a small kitchen and a small table with two chairs in the middle. Then there's the back room with his bed, a rug, a chair in the corner, and a small chest of drawers. There's a small tapestry that ha that hangs on the wall in the, of the front room, and that's it. We spent yesterday staying in the back room, being quiet, reading and drawing, and hoping no one came to hurt us. Our house stood dark and empty. Now we had no carriage and could only take what we could carry on our backs. We would have to leave your painting with Causey. Papa was worried about the water. Dottie said it was too heavy, that she didn't need much. Papa made us take extra anyway. We sat on the floor with our backs against the walls. Emil and I sat on one side, Papa and Dottie on the other. It was strange not being allowed to speak. Suddenly, all I wanted to do was talk. I wonder if that's how normal children feel all the time. 
I wanted to ask how Papa felt about leaving the house and the hospital. I wanted to ask him if he was scared. I wanted to ask him if we were ever coming back. Emil and I had short, whispering conversations, but then Papa would put his finger over his mouth, and an hour would go by, and we wouldn't speak. My mouth itched with words. Would people really hear us talking? But I didn't dare cross Papa. I kept hoping we would somehow get to stay. We would sleep in Cotty's cottage for a few days, and then quietly move back into our house. The hope I felt made the hours a little shorter and pulled me along. Cosy sat outside guarding the house. I longed to sit with him. Cosy and Papa made a plan. I'm on page 111. Cosy would knock three times on the door if he sensed danger, and we were all supposed to climb out the back window and run to the garden shed behind Cosy's, Cosy's cottage. I couldn't imagine Papa and Dottie climbing out the window. Thinking about it made the corners of my mouth turn up and twitch, even though I knew I shouldn't smile at such things. I noted that this was movements to show emotion. Every few hours, Dottie would give us a bit of roti and lentils to eat with a few radishes and a slice of mango. Okay, here's the, the uh, mango description for your reading um, question. I saved my mango slices wrapped in a cloth napkin so I could eat them all at once before bed. Every time I ate a mango slice, I felt happy for that moment. The more slices, the longer the happiness. When I got my mat ready for sleep, I still tasted the syrupy mango juice on my tongue. Emil whispered in my ear. This was the longest day of my life, he said. I nodded hard and leaned against his bony shoulder. Dottie sat cross-legged and hummed prayers very softly. Papa did stretches. If I thought the quiet was hard, Emil must have been ready to explode. I tried to read, but I couldn't concentrate on anything. I was waiting for a chance to talk to Kazi. Page 112. I was also listening for rioters, for the scrape of shoes on the dirt, the first sounds of yelling growing closer, and the crackle of a torch. I listened for Kazi's knocks. I thought of you too, Mama. I thought about your painting of the hand with the egg. Maybe you painted it when you were pregnant with us, your belly big, all the windows open, the breeze blowing through the house. Maybe when you painted that picture, you were happier than you'd ever been, would ever be. We left this morning when the sun was just starting to peek through the clouds. Emil looked at me nervously. He bit his lip. Dottie patted our hands. It will be okay, she said. Your papa will get us to the other side. I didn't want to go to the other side. It reminded me of dead people, the people in the hospital that papa couldn't save. You, mama, you are on the other side. We're still here. Where's Cosy? Emil whispered to Papa as we followed out the door. One goodbye is enough, I think, Papa said in a hoarse tone. Then we walked out on the dirt path past our house. I couldn't look, look at it straight on, only out of the corner of my eye. I wanted to see Cosy's face one last time. Would he be mad at me because I never properly said goodbye? I should have. How stupid of me to think I'd have another chance. I pressed the lump of the mortar and pestle in my bag. This is all I was left with. I cried softly, making no sound, only my shoulders shaking. Then I swallowed it all down. We didn't walk through town. It was too dangerous. We walked through shaggy fields of prickly grasses until we found a clear path toward the desert. There were people behind and in front of us. Some people had ox carts. Excuse me filled high with belongings. Some people rode camels. We carried less than everyone else around us except for the water. We each had a large jug that would last us a few days before we would need to fill it. Papa carried two. Papa told us before we left to keep our heads down, not to talk to anyone, no matter who they were. Dottie walked close to me. She told me I must keep myself as covered as I could with my shawl that I'm bigger now and strange men can't be trusted. I didn't tell Dottie this, but I only trust four people in the world anyway. I trust Papa, Dottie, Emil, and Cosy. And you, Mama, I trust you. It feels like we're really in a story now. I've heard about stories like these, about people who flee their homes in a war with nothing but the clothes and food on their backs. Now that's who we are, even though there's not a war here but it's like a war. 
It seems almost like a, like a made-up word. It makes each footstep I take feel numb, like my foot isn't actually touching the ground, like I'm not in my body. We had to leave our chess set. We also had to leave my old doll, D. Deepu Auntie gave it to me when I was two, so I called the doll D to remind me of her. While I walked, I thought about D, thought about her frayed orange and gold sari and the red color painted on her tiny lips. She even had little gold earrings dangling from her ears and a green jeweled bindi on her forehead. I suddenly missed her so much that my chest hurt. Even though I hadn't played with Dee since I was ten, she'd sat in the corner of my side of the room to keep watch over me and Emil. Now she would probably be taken by a new girl who would find her. We walked all day carrying our packs. Dottie couldn't walk that fast, so we went slowly. Papa said we had to cover at least ten miles a day, more if we could, and it should take about four hours, but with breaks, it would probably be closer to five or six. Today, our first day, we walked seven hours slowly with breaks, so we probably did around 15 miles. Papa told us we could only have a small drink of water every hour, which was hard, but I only sipped when Papa told us to. I saw Emil sneaking a sip or two, but I didn't say anything. Tonight, Papa found us a place next to a big rock near clumps of desert brush. It's kind of like a cave. He didn't want to be too near the other families who were also stopping for the night. Papa likes to be private. At home, we didn't have many people come over. I think his only close friend was Dr. Ahmed. Papa always liked a good party, but he said when he came home after the hospital, he just wanted to have some peace and quiet. I think Papa likes to doctor people more than he likes to enjoy people. We put down our packs and Papa asked us to help him make a fire to keep away the animals and insects. I helped Emil find the right sticks and dead leaves. Then Papa arranged the sticks into a pile with the dried leaves under and lit a match from the box he brought. We all sat and watched the fire eat the leaves, little lapping tongues of flame climbing up the branches. What is it about fire? I can't take my eyes off it. Page 116. After a good blaze nut got going, we warmed our dinner on it, more roti and dal. We only have one pot with us. We have a stack of roti, dal, nuts, dried fruit, and a few bags of dried peas, lentils, and rice. Papa, Emil said as he sat on the ground and chewed the dry roti, is that all the food we have? He pointed to the bag Papa had carried. And what if we run out of water? Emil asked. Sip carefully. One drink an hour. We will find a place to fill it back up. But what if, Emil started to say, Papa put his finger on his lips. One drink an hour, Papa said. Then we'll find a place to get more. In the middle of nothing? Emil said, swinging his arm around. Papa glared at him, the light from the fire dancing in his eyes. Emil finally closed his mouth and tended the fire. We checked for scorpions before we sat down. For sleep, we had a huge mosquito net that would cover all of us. We needed to keep all our belongings around us, the water, the food, packed tightly in bags and jugs so no animals or people would steal it. We sat for a while around the fire, and Dottie sang, her high-pitched voice winding around the air like a butterfly. Another um, example of a simile. Emil drew some pictures in the sand with a stick. I didn't want to take my diary out in front of everyone and have Papa see but it's a habit now, a jumpy feeling that starts in my fingers at night. I was getting that feeling as darkness fell all around us. I got it out from my bag with my pencil. Papa watched me. I sat back down and started to write. What is that, Nisha? Papa asked. My diary, I said in a tiny voice. Your diary? He asked, looking more serious than ever. My fingers tightened around it. Kazi gave it to me. Now I know what Kazi meant about writing down all the things that grown-ups won't be able to. Papa turned his head to the side. His face softened. Carry on then, he said, but only for a few minutes. You need to rest. So I was kind of shocked about Papa's reaction to the diary. Um, but we can tell, especially by um, this last statement, um, that he turned his head to the side and his face softened. And then he lets her go on with the diary 
which shows that he is understanding. He he realizes Nisha's need to get out her feelings because she doesn't talk a lot, and this is the way that she, uh, one of the ways she's able to express herself and deal with the situation. Yes, Papa, I said, and pressed my pencil to the paper, feeling an electric tingle go up my arm. Then I wrote this. Love, Nisha. Okay, page 118. August 20th, 1947. Dear Mama, we're almost out of water. We wouldn't have been so soon, but Emil spilled both his and Dottie's when he tried to carry the two jugs as we packed up this morning. Papa rushed him, telling him he should carry more stuff, that he was almost a man and he should carry Dottie's pack too. But Emil is so wiry and thin, like a twig you could easily snap in half. We have another simile. I'll bet Dottie could carry more. He did what he was told, and as he slung both his and Dottie's pack on his back, and as he was carrying the water jugs and the bed rolls, the jugs fell to the ground, the caps popping off. He didn't even notice at first, but I did. I heard it before I saw it, the water making its glug glug noise, creating a little stream in the dry ground. A meal! I yelled and ran over to the water. I righted them in the sandy dirt, picked up the caps, and screwed them on quickly as if moving fast would reverse the damage. Dottie and Papa just stared. I looked up at Emil's face. His mouth hung open. His eyes seemed so wide and helpless it made my chest hurt. Emil looked at Papa like a little dog about to be kicked. I stood up, holding the almost empty jugs, and stood in front of Emil, facing Papa, putting myself between them. Papa slowly walked toward us. Emil lowered his eyes. Papa's mouth was a straight, thin line. He took the jugs from me and placed them on the ground. Then he silently lined up our other jugs and poured a bit of water from each and evened them out. He handed them back to us. Don't spill it again. There's life in there. Treat it like that, he said to Emil with gritted teeth. Okay, I want you to note the metaphor Papa uses in comparing the water to life. And why is that? Why would he compare the water to life? Okay, think about that. Emil kept his head down and nodded. I'm sorry, Papa. Emil's eyes started to well up, my whole body tensed. Don't cry, Emil. Please don't cry, I wish. Emil always cried more than I did. When he was little, he threw lots of tantrums. Papa's face would grow redder and redder as Emil would stomp around and cry because he broke his toy or because Dottie wanted him to sit and finish his dinner. Okay, page 120. I always wondered why Emil wasn't scared of Papa like I was. But maybe Emil just couldn't help it. Eventually, Papa would take him over his knee and give him a swift hit on his bottom. I knew it didn't really hurt Emil, but it always stopped him. Then Papa's face would collapse, and I could see the regret in his eyes. Emil would stand up, rubbing his behind, and sit back down, finally eating or picking up his toy. But that was years ago. Now Emil knew better than to throw a tantrum. Why do you do that? I once asked him when he was still li when we were still little enough to be sleeping in the same bed. Do what? Emil asked. Make Papa so mad, I said. I don't know, Emil said. Papa really looks at me when I cry. He always feel bad he always feels bad when he hits you, I said. That's the best part, he had said. Now I wondered if Papa was mad enough to hit Emil. I know you're sorry, was all Papa said. He briskly wiped the tears that started to fall off Emil's face. Don't cry. Your body needs to hold on to all the water it has. I was relieved at first as we continued on the trail. But since it was obvious Papa wasn't going to hit him, I felt a burst of anger at Emil. Why couldn't he be more careful? What if we couldn't get water fast enough? But I couldn't say that to Emil. Um, then I would be like Papa. I don't want to be like Papa. I want to be like you were, Mama bright and elegant, creating beauty all around you, always kind. That's how I think you were. I can tell by your picture, see it in your eyes. Sometimes I want to be like Kazi too, safe with my vegetables, spices, and knives in the kitchen, letting the food speak for me. Okay, that is also text evidence of um, your question that you have to answer with the food and how the author uses it as a way for Nisha to express herself and also to kind of create mood in the scenes. Okay, so take note of this one. 21. 
I love Papa, but I don't want to be as serious and sad as he is. And yet I'm probably like Papa the most. Is Emil like you? He's not really elegant, but he's hardly ever sad. Even when he is, the happiness starts to creep in and makes his legs jumpy. His eyes flicker. The happy energy always takes over. For me, it's the opposite. We tried to drink even less water today, and my throat started to feel dry. My legs began quivering like jelly in the heat. We did find some mango orchards, and were able to each grab a bunch for our sacks. Papa said to only eat two a day. I ate one and saved the other for hours, feeling the weight of the mango hit my back as we walked. I finally ate it while we rested by some rocks. I opened the skin with my teeth and pulled the rest of it off with my hand and bit into it. The tangy, thick juice flooded my mouth and I shivered. My teeth sank farther into the soft, ripe flesh. After only eating old roti and dal and not much water, it was like eating a fruit custard made out of honey and butter. I wanted to stay there resting, eating mangoes, the breeze flowing on me, almost like I was on a holiday, not fleeing the only home I'd ever, I've ever had. Um, this reference to the mangoes could also be used in, your, um, in the question that you have to answer after this reading. Kazi used to cut up every mango in four pieces, two large ones along the flat side of the big pit in the middle, and two small ones along the edges of the pit. Emil and I would fight over the pit, loving to gnaw every bit of fruit off it, the filmy stickiness coating our hands and face. We've probably walked about 18 miles or more. We have almost used up our, used up our roti and dal, but we still have the dry rice, peas, and lentils. Will Rashi and Uncle be kind to us when we arrive there, Mama? It's so strange that we are meeting him now. I'm a little excited and also afraid. Does he hate Papa? All this time, your brother was 65 miles away, and we never knew it. My feet are burning even as I sit here and write. I only have one pair of worn leather sandals. I wrap my blisters in cool leaves, but they keep falling off. It still feels so strange to say that the ground where my, where my sore feet step on is not India anymore, but a place called Pakistan. I feel bad for the people who carry many things piled on wagons on, and their backs. They tried to take too much. Papa says that once we are over the border, he will be able to find work easily, that doctors are always needed. Papa says his brothers will have a home for us in Jodhpur, and we will get new things eventually. That's why we barely took anything. I feel lucky that Papa is a doctor. It's the only thing I feel lucky about uh, right now as I try to sleep on my mat, flat against the earth, staring up at the sky, staring up at the clear sky through the fog of the mosquito net, my throat tasting like dust. Love, Nisha. Okay, page 124. Make sure this is still rolling. It is. Okay, August 21st, 1947. Dear Mama, I woke up feeling terrible today. My tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth. My head pounded. My fingers tingled. When I tried to get up, my arms and legs felt filled with sand. Emil, I said, nudging him out of sleep. Are you feeling strange? He mumbled something I couldn't understand. I looked over at Papa and he opened his eyes, and we stared in a way that we never look at each other. Not like father and daughter, but simply like two people who are both scared. It made me see Papa suddenly as a person, not just my Papa. Like a secret door had opened, then he blinked and it was over. So I think that Nisha's perspective of her papa is really starting to change here. So that was what I noted about that particular um, part in, in uh, this entry. I crawled over my mat past Emil, who had fallen back asleep, and I kneeled next to papa. He put his hand on my shoulder. Excuse me. Today we will find water, he said. I nodded. I wanted to ask him now, but I didn't want him to take his hand away. So I kept silent, but he removed it anyway. I knew we couldn't walk ten miles today without water. We only had a couple sips left in our jugs. Is your mouth dry? Papa asked, sitting up cross-legged on his mat. Not really, I murmured in a gravelly voice, turning away from him. He leaned over and told me to open my mouth. 
I did as he asked. He squinted in, examining the inside as he pressed his strong fingers against the sides of my face. Then he checked my eyes by lifting up my eyelids. He took my pulse and lightly pinched the skin on the back of my hand. You're okay, he said. You have another day in you. Another day? And then what? I didn't want to know. Then he went over to Emil. He shook his shoulder, but Emil just moaned with his eyes closed. Emil, Papa said loudly. Emil stirred and turned towards Papa. Dottie came over and squatted by his shoulder. Sit up, Papa said sternly. Emil just blinked at him. Sit up, Papa said even louder. Emil hoisted himself up. Page 126. I feel sick, Emil said in a scratchy voice, his skin dry, his eyes sunken. Papa did all the things he did to me, but he didn't tell Emil he had another day in him. Do you have any more water? Papa asked Emil. Emil shook his head and looked down, shame in his hunched shoulders. He poked his finger into the sandy dirt. He made a line, then another. A picture of a tree suddenly appeared. Papa gave him his own jug. Emil shook his head. Take it, you must, and he thrust it at Emil and swatted his drawing hand. Papa, Emil said, taking the jug and shaking it a little. There's only a sip in here. I don't deserve to finish your water. Now, the first time I read this, read this, I wondered, okay, why did he say that? Why doesn't he deserve it? Okay, nonsense, Papa said. Drink. Emil drank it in one small gulp. I'm sorry, Papa, he said, his eyes down on the ground again. He stared at the tree he made. I went over to my sack, pulled out my last mango, and handed it to Emil. Did you at least save a mango? Papa asked Emil. Emil nodded. We all had one left. Let's eat them now, and we'll find more today. Nisha, eat yours. Emil has his own. And water, Dottie said. We must find water. Dottie's voice was also rough and dry. I looked at her. She appeared pale and sunken around her eyes. Poor Dottie. She should be resting in her favorite chair, singing softly as she mended Papa's shirts. I wouldn't dare say this out loud, but I'm so angry at all the leaders, like Gina and Nehru, who were supposed to know better, who were supposed to protect us, who were supposed to make sure things like this didn't happen. I'm even angry at Gandhi for not being able to stop it. So here Nisha shows anger at all the opposing perspectives of the leaders around her that were supposed to control this. Papa seemed fine. Nothing weakened Papa. In fact, I could never remember him ever being sick. Not once. How was that possible? He worked with sickness and disease his whole adult life. Maybe Papa isn't actually human, but a god watching over us. His first name, Suresh, means that he's a ruler of all the gods, the protector, another name for Lord Vishnu. Maybe the worried look in his eye as he examined me and Emil was just for show. Mama, did you ever think that about Papa? Page 128. Papa made me take the last of my water. I took one sip and handed the jug to Dottie. No, no, sweet child, she said, patting my arm. I have a bit left. But... I didn't see her sip from a jug. I held the jug toward Papa. Drink, he said with stern eyes. So I did. I let it trickle down my throat, but it wasn't enough. I couldn't think of anything more beautiful than buckets of cool, clean water to drink. I ate my mango, but my tongue felt numb and I could barely taste it this time. The thickness of the fruit clung to my lips. It made me yearn for water even more. Okay, that's the second part, um, page 128, what I just read about the mangoes, that you need to look at for your question that you're answering. Okay? We gathered our belongings silently. Normally, I was the one who was quiet, my family making noise around me. I liked the noises, Emil's chattering, Dottie singing her prayers, Papa directing us to do this and that, and Cosi talking to me in the kitchen. He was the only one in my house who never minded if I didn't answer back, which made me want to talk more. Now the silence covered all of us like mist. We rolled our mats, packed our sacks, and arranged them on our backs. I picked up Dottie's jug when she wasn't looking and shook it. It was empty. Again, I was thankful for the little we had to carry except for the water. We should have brought a wagon load. 
I didn't think much about water back home. But Dahl, the water man, would bring it up the hill to our compound every day from the well. Two leather sacks hung from a big pole across his back. He whistled happily while he walked up the hill, as if he were carrying feathers. I never thought about how heavy it must have been, and how lucky we were to have someone bring it to us every day. A wave of shame rippled through the center of my body and made me feel sicker. What I thought about in Anisha talking about, um, you know, she never thought about the water before. They always just had somebody bring her to, bring it to them. You know, what was what are some of the things that maybe we took for granted a little bit before um, COVID, before the coronavirus? Um, just a you know, text to self, text to world connection opportunity here. Okay, now it feels like water is the only thing I've ever wanted. It isn't only thirst. We haven't washed since we started out. A film of dirt, dust, and sweat coat me like a light covering of hair. My feet are caked with dirt. My teeth feel like apricot skin. It's strange that we don't even have to go to the bathroom anymore. I tried not to think of water as I hoisted my pack and bedroll on my back. I saw a family walking past us in the same direction. I caught a girl's eyes, a few years younger than me, hair and clothing rumpled and dirty. She looked like a small, frightened animal, weighed down by her belongings. Excuse me. I probably looked like that to her. Page 130. Papa went ahead to the passing family and leaned his head toward the man of the group, probably speaking in his firm but gentle doctorly tone that made everything seem all right even when it was terribly wrong. He pointed over to us and turned back. The man wiggled his head and Papa walked back. What did you say, Papa? Emil said, perking up from the moment of mystery. I asked for water. I offered him some of our food. Excuse me again. But they only have a bit left with four children. He said there's running water in the next village an hour away. How does he know that? Emil asked. Use your head. There's always water in a village. Emil didn't dare ask any more questions. There was something comforting in the way that Papa was treating Emil. It was the way he always treated him, like an annoying fly. But still, I wish Papa would be nicer to him. Emil is only being all he knows how to be. But I guess Papa is too. I guess we all are. It's just that some people are better at being than others. We continue to walk in silence. Papa in the front, me, Emil, then Dottie in a line. There were people up ahead and behind. The dirt felt hard underfoot, and the sun beamed hotly on our bodies, drying them out even more. I thought of Kazi and the dried apricots, mangoes and tomatoes he used to make by hanging thin slices in the sun. I loved the chewiness of the dried fruit, their taste pure and sun-filled, no water to interrupt the flavor. Emil never liked to eat dried fruit. He said it reminded him of the skin of very old people. I thought of a shriveling up like pieces of sliced mangoes. I slowed my pace a little so Emil could catch up to me. I glanced behind me. His steps didn't have the bounce in them they normally did. Are you okay? I, was, I asked him in a whisper and touched his shoulder. He nodded. His eyes were dull. Really? I said, my heart speeding up a bit. He nodded again. Because you can tell me if you're not, I said. Nisha, he said through gritted teeth, stop. So I closed my mouth and walked next to him instead of in front of him. Papa was ahead of us, since Emil was slow, but I didn't care. I matched my pace with Emil exactly as I could, making sure our feet hit and left the ground at the exact same time. I made it a game and the sound of our footballs became a beat to a, a footfalls, sorry, not footballs. Our footfalls became a beat to a song I heard in my head. It was an old song I heard, a song that Dottie used to sing to us before bed when we were little. Emil used to sing with Dottie, and Dottie would shush him and tell him he wouldn't fall asleep if he sang with her. I remember wishing he would be quiet too. I just wanted to hear Dottie's voice. Sometimes I would close my eyes and pretend it was you singing to us, Mama. But he would stop only for a few seconds and then start up again. I realized I haven't heard Emil sing in a long time. What I would do to hear him sing now. Love, Nisha.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed. Bye!